Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another session of Intellectus Campus. Um, the rules of um, how we're running the session are on the screen, which you can see. And I'd just like to advise everybody that you will be muted as you arrive. Um, people who unmute their mics will unfortunately need to be removed from the call because we do have international speakers on this call and um, we need to be considerate to everybody who is on the call. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Howard Chavis and welcome Dr. Chavis and thank you for, um, for being on the call half an hour early and sorting out all the tech. And well done to Pride and Zabri for sorting out the tech because us old people can't run the tech. Um, thank you for joining us today from New York and um, to give your presentation on medical organ therapy and introduction. So Dr. Chavis is a board certified psychiatrist and he is certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. He is a medical organist trained by the medical by the American College of Organomy and board certified by the American Board of Medical Organomy. He's an editor of the Journal of Organomy and has authored many articles found there. He's in private practices with offices in both New York City and in the New York suburb of um, Scarsdale. Welcome, Dr. Chavis. Your bio is much longer than that, but it is on the SADAC group. So anybody who would like to read um, your bio can access it on the SADAC group. And with that, um, we have almost 100 people on the call and I'm conscious of time. So I'd like to hand the floor over to you. Um, I'd just like to mention to our audience as a theme that we've had for this year for 2024 is that we like the idea of constructive controversy. I think all of us have experienced um, not being able to hear both sides of the debate. And in order to debate, we must be able to think for ourselves. So I'm very excited. We've also discussed the concept of Kufunga Sisa, which in the languages here means um, overthinking or thinking too much. People here, there's a huge social stigma around depression and anxiety. And put your mics. Right, please remove that person from the call. Thank you. Um, and we, because of the cultural stigma surrounding depression and anxiety, we um, we call it Kufunga Sisa. And dance, telling stories, being able to speak, friendship benches, grandmothers are better deliverers of psychiatric care than doctors, as is no surprise to you, I'm sure. And I'm really looking forward to this talk and welcome. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing and allow you to share your screen. So, thank you, Dr. Stone. I want to say hello to everyone zooming in. I'd like to thank Dr. Stone and Dr. Okuma and Intellectus Campus for inviting, inviting me to give today's talk, Medical Organ Therapy and Introduction. In my presentation, I'm going to be talking about natural science, which is the study and knowledge of objects and processes observable in nature. This includes all aspects of human functioning. I'm going to briefly describe how Wilhelm Reich came to develop medical organ therapy. This will allow us to see ourselves in a natural scientific perspective. That is from the perspective of how nature functions. Reich referred to this way of thinking as functional thinking. This, by the way, is distinct from today's mechanistic thinking, which in the realm of technology and machines is completely rational. In the realm of the living, not at all. Wilhelm Reich, a physician and a student and colleague of Sigmund Freud in the 1920s and early 1930s, developed medical organ therapy, a unique therapy which addresses and dissolves chronic defensive rigidity in both the patient's character, the character's characteristic way the individual lives in the world and in their musculature. Orgone is the name Reich gave to the mass-free energy he discovered in his laboratory research 
in the middle part of the 1930s in the atmosphere in 1940, and which he scientifically investigated until his death in 1957. Origami is not origami, the Japanese art of paper folding. It is the science of work on energy, which includes medical ergonomy, social ergonomy, orgone biology, orgone physics, and so on. I'm going to introduce some concepts that you're unfamiliar with or likely have never heard of. Also, please note, I readily acknowledge that my culture is different than your cultures, the particulars of which I know little or nothing about. However, despite these differences, the common functioning principle which unites us all, Reich's perspective is, and therefore mine, is biological. In a cautionary way, I'm also going to say the following. For some of you, try to be aware that and how you are dismissive of what I'm trying to get across, specifically using what you already know or think you know or believe to reflexively close your mind to me and what I'm saying. Perhaps even deriding what I say as simplistic or mystical. Also regarding questions or comments you may have, please send them to me via the Zoom chat feature. I'll answer them after my presentation. First, I'd like you to look at the following brief videotape segment of a living amoeba seen through the microscope magnified 800 times. Okay. So let me see if I can get this moving. Is this moving? I'm not sure. Okay. Do you see it? Okay. So we're looking at a living amoeba seen through the microscope. Dr. Travis? Yes. Um, one of the, I know what you've done because I've done it before by mistake as well, is if you stop sharing screen. Okay. And when you go into share screen, make sure you enable video. Okay, let me see how, how I can do that. Oh, boy. Technology. So I'm stopping screen share. Stop screen share. And then screen share again. And in the bottom right corner, it should ask you whether you... Oh, I see, yes. I see it. Okay. So you need to so enable video. Do I click that first? Or do I click? Okay, got it. Okay. Perfect. Now it should work. Perfect. We can see it now. Okay. Okay. So what do we see? Now I want to stop screen. You, you see the amoeba, right? Of course. Okay. So how do I stop this? It's almost finished. Okay. Just the okay. easiest to, to exit. I got it. Okay. 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 So what do we see that is common to all of nature? Spontaneous movement, expansion, contraction, pulsation. Now, if we think of expansion in terms of weather, what constitutes expansion and expansive day? And how do people feel on such a day? It's sunny and you generally feel positive, energetic and outgoing. Conversely, what constitutes contraction, a contractive day? And how do you feel on such a day? It's cloudy, overcast, rainy, and people generally feel less outgoing, sometimes low. And how do you feel when you see your child take a first step or you reach out to hold your mate whom you haven't seen for a long time? Conversely, how do you feel and where do you feel it when the car you're driving begins to slide on a wet road, or you see someone suspicious and believe you may be the victim of a robbery. What I'm describing by way of your own emotions and sensations is that the human organism expands and contracts, it pulsates, and that this pulsation is a biological phenomenon. It is not a poetic metaphor. In a series of experiments with human subjects, Reich demonstrated that the subjective experience of pleasure and, and anxiety could be measured objectively. Using the technology of the day, in 1934, a vacuum tube amplifier and an oscillograph, Wright demonstrated what he called the basic antithesis of vegetative life. 
That is that pleasure and anxiety are literally opposite feelings. In other words, in pleasure, something which he later discovered to be orgone energy moves out to the skin surface toward the world. And in anxiety, something moves away from the skin, away from the world to the core of the body. For emphasis, let me point out here that if you ask most doctors or psychiatrists or anyone else for that matter, what is emotion? Chances are you won't get the simple reality discovered by right. That emotion is the perception of energy flow and movement in the body. Utilizing his experimental observations and the research of Krauss and Zondek, he discovered that pleasure is functionally identical to excitation of the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system and anxiety to excitation of the sympathetic branch. That is when considered from the perspective of the total organism, excitation of parasympathetic and sympathetic innovations of bodily organs produces respectively expansion or reaching out and contraction or withdrawal inward. The meaning of this in terms of the vegetative antithesis is, antithesis is clear. The anatomic activities of the biosystem, contraction at the periphery and dilatation of the organs in the core of the body is consistent with movement away from the world. With parasympathetic excitation or expansion, these functions are exactly opposite. There is movement toward the world. This is the mechanism that anchors pulsation in the human body. In the nine decades since Reich performed these experiments, the intricacies of the autonomic nervous system and its two divisions, including the neurotransmitters of the brain, have been explored and described by researchers and scientists. However, the concept of a biological periphery and core has been overlooked by classical medicine and science. At this point, you may be thinking, how did Reich, a psychoanalyst, come to focus on excitation, expansion and contraction, on biological pulsation, pulsation? We know from his own written description that he had always been interested in the energy process and that this for him received priority over substance or matter. As a medical student, he was drawn to Freud and psychoanalysis because of Freud's psychic energy concept of libido and his discovery of infantile and childhood sexuality, the psychosexual stages of development. Early in his analytic work, Reich's search for the emotional intensity so often absent in his patients led to his discovery that feelings, emotions, were bound up in and by rigid character reactions and structure, what he called character armor. This was the first time that the character, the chronic characteristic way an individual interacts with the world was identified as defensive. He pointed out that in our neurotic world, character in general and specific character types in particular, such as the hysteric, the phallic narcissist, the obsessive and compulsive, are formed in everyone according to certain determinants, but always as the result of a traumatic conflict between the infant and child's individual spontaneous expressions, their natural impulses, and the limitations imposed by the environment, usually the parents. Although there may be cultural differences in child rearing practices, this is still universal, universally true. Although its original function is positive protection, there is a cost to this armor. No matter the individual's character, characteristic attitudes or traits, there, were there is a decrease in emotional motility and liveliness, a decrease in the ability to open oneself up or to close oneself up. In the 1920s, Reich observed that individuals with rigid character defenses, character armor, also had muscular hypertrophy and rigidity. When the patient's character defenses yielded to character analysis, the approach Reich developed to dissolve character armor, the chronic muscular rigidity also softened. With a particular patient with a stiff-necked attitude, when the defense finally let go, the patient experienced a spontaneous, traumatic, autonomic, physical reaction of his face. This is how Reich came to discover muscular armor and its function, which led him to work directly on patients' chronically tense musculature. Muscular armor is a natural biological defense. It is sometimes even seen in newborns. We all tense up in stressful situations and hold our breath, but we then relax and let go when the situation passes. 
When muscular armoring becomes chronic, however, it interferes with natural, emotional, and physical motility. And depending on its severity and distribution, it can also interfere with natural physiologic processes and could lead to physical disease. Reich described the anatomical distribution of human skeletal musculature as segments arranged perpendicular to the long axis of the body, much like the annular segments of a snake or worm. worm. As shown in the following diagram, there were seven segments, ocular, oral, cervical, thoracic, diaphragmatic, abdominal, and pelvic. Now let's see if I can do this now. Okay, let's see. Whoops. Okay. Can see it well. You see it? Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so now we can. So you see this, the seven segments ocular, oral. Cervical, thoracic, diaphragmatic, abdominal, and pelvic. Okay. So clinical experience reveals that muscular armoring is laid down in these segments in a functional distribution. This means, for example, when the newborn spontaneously, instinctually reaches out with its eyes to its mother, part of the natural process of newborn maternal bonding, and it sees the anxiety, coldness, or even hatred in her eyes, it will pull back and contract, especially in the ocular segment, the eyes, the scalp, the occiput, and even the brain, if the trauma is severe enough. Based on his clinical observations and experience, incredibly, and this is incredible, in the susceptible organism, he saw that significant ocular armoring, the result of early trauma in the first few weeks of life, and even in the womb, was correlated with the development of schizophrenia. For the medical organomist, ocular armor is observable even in the newborn. Another example, if the child is not allowed to speak, if it is verbally or even non-verbally somehow told to be quiet, to keep quiet, it must hold back the impulse and does so with tension in the throat, mouth, neck, and upper thorax. If breastfeeding is stopped prematurely, or if it is accompanied by significant enough maternal anxiety or disgust, the infant may armor in the mouth with tension in the masseters, the extra oral musculature in the back of the neck. Premature toilet training before the infant has developed natural control of the anal sphincter. And this control will develop spontaneously in every human infant. It can only succeed, uh, premature toilet training can only succeed through contraction of the muscles of the pelvic floor, the buttocks and thighs, aided by retraction of the pelvis and inhibition of respiration. And so muscular armor is laid down layer upon layer during the child's development and is the somatic physical basis of armored character formation and the armored character uh, itself. Thus, what I've described is that armored parents in direct proportion to the distribution and severity of their own armor create armored babies and children. This accounts, sadly, for how, how our sweet babies and children become to one degree or another complicated, difficult adults. Let me also point out here that permissive parenting, often thought of as a positive answer to suppression of the infant and child, is often even more destructive because the parents may be even more out of touch, clueless with the emotional needs of their youngster. Because it blocks movement of sensation and emotion, armoring always interferes with the individual's ability to make contact with themselves, with others, and with the world. Contact, the quality, you might say, of being there, the ability to make and sustain an emotional, energetic connection is determined by the capacity to tolerate intensities of sensation. Here, I'd like to point out the importance of energetic emotional contact as essential to the treatment of patients, sometimes but not always recognized. With chronic armoring present in this life in everyone to a greater or lesser degree, there was always some degree of contactlessness or cluelessness. 
armoring, especially the ocular armor, and the resultant contactlessness are the biological, biophysical basis of perceptual distort, distortion and also the psychological ego mechanisms of defense, denial, projection, and so on. Because armor prevents direct contact, contact with oneself and the outside world, armored thinking is always mechanistic and or mystical. Thus, there are two basic different kinds of individuals, the armored, in the real world, those without significant armor, and those with armor. The structure of the individual, individual without significant armor is graphically portrayed. Now let's see if I can get to that. Okay. So what we see here, um, wait, what happened? I can see the picture. You can see, but I, unfortunately, I can't. Um, well, there's the biological core and the worldview. So if you know the picture, you can talk us through it. Okay, but I, I want, actually, I want to use my cursor to show it. But I, since okay. I can't see it, I'll just have to go, ask you to look for it. The biological core, which is at the very center of the diagram, is the home of our individual nature. What we're born with, the source of our healthy primary impulses, what we see in infants and children. The biological core is real, not imaginary, poetic, or psychological. It is comprised of the autonomic nervous system from which biological excitation arises. The social layer, that's the outer layer, is that part of our structure which interfaces with the world. In health, this layer is in more or less direct contact with the biological core. The middle layer contains the armor, which in health is transitory. We all need to defend and hold back feelings when necessary, but then let go. Such an individual is uncomplicated. Rare, but there are such individuals. Okay, so now I'm going to stop the screen share. I'll do this screen share again. Let's see if this works. So yeah, when armor... Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Yeah. When armor becomes chronic, however, the social aspect becomes a social veneer or facade. That's the social facade, which is separated from the biolog biological core by the secondary or great middle layer. This is graphically portrayed in the diagram that you see. So the great middle layer is the repository of the harsh, destructive secondary impulses which form as the result of the frustration and distortion of core impulses as they try to break through the armor. And uh, you can see, I, well, you can see, I can't, that the impulses from the biological core trying to get through the armor are distorted and bent. So what Reich showed is that chronic armoring is the source of human destructiveness, of human evil. Reich referred to this middle layer as the realm of the devil. The social facade then has a defensive function. Its sociability and rules protect against expression of these destructive secondary impulses. From these two figures, we can cl we'll clearly see the logical goal of or medical organ therapy. It is to remove the restrictions to the free flow of energy throughout the body, to restore the individual's capacity for natural bio-emotional, bio-energetic pulsation. In practical terms, the goal is to dissolve sufficient chronic characterological and muscular armor and restore the individual's capacity for making and sustaining emotional contact. In other words, to restore our capacity to be spontaneous and free-flowing like the amoeba when external circumstances allow. There are three basic tools the medical organist uses in this task. One is to have the patient breathe fully, but not in a forced or mechanical fashion. This builds up or excites the individual's energy charge, which in turn 
exerts a push against the muscular arm. Some holding then often yields with the spontaneous release of crying, anger, fear, or other emotions. A patient came to me saying, I need to cry, but I can't. She felt frustrated, anxious, and blocked. Her previous several years of talk therapy, therapy had been unable to help her. With her sitting Morning. up, with her sitting up, I saw that she had significant holding in her chest, which appeared immobile, and some holding in her face. I asked her to lay down on the couch on her back and had her breathe through her mouth and move her face. After just a few minutes, she began to cry, first without sound, then with sobbing from deep within her chest. This continued for about 10 to 15 minutes. She told me she felt deeply sad, although she didn't know why. She also said she felt relief. This was her very first session. Another patient in his early 30s, who I had seen for several previous sessions, lay on the couch and started breathing as I had recommended. He soon began to spontaneously cry and then, and then let out the most god-awful frightening sounds and thrashed about on the couch. This lasted for many, many minutes. He then quieted down and after several more minutes, told me how he had just re-experienced the terrible beatings his mother gave him when he was seven years old. Another tool employed by the medical ergonomist is direct work on the patient's spastic tense musculature. The general principle is simple. Pressing on a tense muscle causes it to contract. Continued pressure causes continued contraction and ultimately fatigue of that muscle. It lets go and whatever emotion was held back by the tense muscle is released. If there is a discrete experience such as a specific traumatic event associated with the held back emotion, the individual will often relive the experience on the couch, complete with the long repressed emotion. There's a feeling of great relief with this emotional release. A patient with hypertension, high blood pressure, was referred by his cardiologist because of depression. I talked with him for a few minutes and he told me he was depressed but didn't know why. I could see that his chest was held high in an inspiratory attitude, if you can see it like this, commonly seen in those with high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. Over several sessions with a patient on the couch, I was able to bring his chest down by pressing on it with the flat of my hand with gradually increasing pressure with each exhalation. With time, I encouraged him to let out any sounds and to move his face. At first indistinct, his sounds and facial expression began to reveal fear. This was gradually replaced by angry growling and yelling. With increased pressure on his chest, he was soon expressing intense rage, which lasted and lasted. Afterwards, he told me how eight years before he was on a city bus and witness some young toughs taunt an elderly woman and steal her pocketbook. No one said or did anything. He alone told them, give the woman back her pocketbook. One of the gang came towards my patient in a threatening way, reaching into a paper bag he was carrying. My patient was terrified and was convinced he'd have to fight for his life. Just then the police arrived and arrested the toughs. There was a gun in the paper bag. My patient saw the gun. In the, in the session, he was not telling me verbally he was afraid and angry. Relieving the muscular armor with direct physical pressure, he expressed the intense emotion he had experienced eight years before, but which had not been expressed and released and instead held in his chest. Another patient, a hardworking married man in his late 60s came to me anxious and depressed. While walking to a doctor's appointment, he was physically attacked by a teenage gang member. Appearing defenseless, he was not. Trained in the martial, martial arts, he took down his assailant. Unfortunately, the assailant called the police and my patient was actually arrested for assault. Found guilty, his arrest record would be expunged after a year uh, without any further legal difficulties. On the couch, pressing on his chest, released the anger and fury held there with relief. When the year was up, 
he decided to terminate his treatment with me. Another patient, a physician, came to me because he had intrusive thoughts of a passive sexual nature, which bothered him greatly, and he was very depressed. Did I prescribe antidepressant medication for him? No. I could readily see he was incredibly held back and physically tense. I put him on the couch and began to work on the superficial layers of muscular armor, his neck in particular, and the back of his head, his occiput. I did not press on his chest, but what came out just by working on the back of his neck and then his jaw was yelling and anger. And it turned out how he lived, took care of his patients, his family and others always came first. Characteristically, characteristically, any time it had to do with him, he took a back seat, if at all. While tremendous frustration and anger built up in him, the intrusive compulsive thoughts were of a passive nature. This reflected his characteristic attitude, how he lived. I addressed this and directly pressed on and dissolved his muscular hormone. Over the course of a once a week, two year therapy, he began to interest, introduce himself, who he really was to his family. For example, he wanted a particular sporty car, but never said, I want this car. He finally spoke up and got his car. His intrusive thoughts diminished and then disappeared. Also incredibly, over the course of his treatment, his adult onset asthma that he had had for at least 15 years and that he took three different medications for also diminished. His medications were tapered and discontinued. Uh, hey, and, thank you. And his asthma disappeared. This is Please not remove unmuted people from the call, Pride. Just put them in the waiting room, thanks. This is not unusual, and his asthma disappeared. This is not unusual for the medical organomist because we understand that phys physical symptoms and illness so often originate from chronic armoring. Rigidity in the muscles of various segments of the body worsened by characteristic defensive attitudes. The third tool employed by the medical organomist is addressing characteristic, characteristic defensive attitudes. A patient lying on the couch out of anxiety often hesitated speaking. I noticed she was holding a tissue. All I said was, you're holding a tissue. She looked down and said, yes, I'm holding on. She then started to cry and began shaking all over. Another long standing patient came into my office and I noticed for the first time that she was shuffling her feet. Did I say to her, you're shuffling your feet or why? No, instead, believe it or not, I shuffled my own feet. At first she laughed and then she started to cry. She felt victimized by the world. As we looked into this and talked about it, it turned out she was afraid to speak up for herself and had a very passive attitude in life. Shuffling my own feet led her to make contact with herself and how she lived. Another patient, successful looking well-dressed in his early 60s, came into my office and sat in the patient's chair. He put his arm over the back of the chair, if you can, if I'm doing it right, sort of like, like this. I listened to him for about three to four minutes and then asked, do you feel as comfortable as you look? He just looked at me and then said, no, I do this to put you with ease so I don't feel anxious. It turned out that in the 30 years of therapy he had previously had with many different therapists from many different schools of therapy, no one either saw or recognized the significance of what was, what was right in front of their eyes. And for me to sit there and listen, listen to the story of his, of his many therapies or anything else for that matter would have been a complete waste of time. And instead, I addressed his obvious to me defensive attitude. A 32-year-old woman came to me unhappy and depressed, a bit angry and anxious. She told me she lived with a man who didn't treat her well, who was, in fact, emotionally abusive. As she spoke, I saw that she smiled. I gently pointed this out to her. You're smiling. She was unaware that she smiled. Occasionally in that very first session, I pointed out her smile and she gradually became aware of just how angry, even furious she was with how her boyfriend treated her. In the second session, 
her fear of speaking up for herself came to the fore. We discussed this and how she could handle the situation. In the third session, she announced she, announced she had kicked out the bum and ended the relationship. In the fourth session, she rem remembered that when she was a girl, her friends called her smiley. This was her last session. She no longer needed treatment. No medication was prescribed. I was asked to see a 33-year-old Chinese woman medically hospitalized for her remarkably distended abdomen. Despite a thorough, extensive workup, no cause could be found for her distressing symptom. I was asked to see her. I went in to see her, identified myself as a psychiatrist, and asked a few basic questions. She told me she was married, had three young children, and lived with her husband in New Jersey. This prompted me to ask, who else lives at home with you? She responded, my mother-in-law. Believe it or not, that gave me her diagnosis. How you ask? Well, here's how. When she said my mother-in-law, I saw her swallow. As we discussed her mother-in-law, this introduces air into the GI tract. As we discussed her mother-in-law visiting from Taiwan, I quickly learned that the woman was relentlessly controlling, cruel and nasty to her daughter-in-law law, and critical of her efforts with her children. Because of their Chinese culture and her own characteristic not speaking up for herself, the patient had to respect her elder, could not defend herself against her mother-in-law's onslaught, and she did not tell her husband. I pointed out her swallowing, her anger surfaced and was expressed more and more fully. We met with her husband and he expedited his mother's return to, to Taiwan. Case solved. Excuse me. Another patient in her early 80s was employed full-time until the pandemic when her firm let her go along with many other employees. Given how emotionally healthy she was, her work function was essential to her well-being. She became depressed. I saw her weekly sitting up and soon learned how cruel her youngest daughter was to her, cutting off all contact with her, including with her grandchildren. I addressed her lifelong characteristic way of reacting, being a nice girl. With treatment, her anger emerged more fully. No mother should be treated by her child the way she was being treated. From the very first session, I saw that her soldiers were hunched up to her, to her ears. After many months, I introduced the idea of, being, of her being on the couch, and she agreed. I gently pressed on the exquisitely sensitive muscles of her neck and shoulders. Out came Sam, then crying, then fury, absolute fury from when she was a little girl. Why? And this is incredibly sad because her father died when she was just six, year old, six years old and her mother refused to allow her to grieve. She became a good girl. In sum, the medical ergonomist uses all three approaches with every patient, addressing the defensive attitude, breathing, work on the tense ridge and musculature. The importance of each depends on the individual patient and the particular circumstances at the moment. The idea that medical organ therapy is just body work or only employs physical technique is an unfortunate misunderstanding. In closing, I want to point out that having an emotional release or moving energy does not constitute medical organ therapy. These experiences may excite people who are looking to feel more, but in and of themselves, they often only bring superficial and temporary relief. There is no substitute for a functional bioenergetic understanding of the patient's defensive structure, which includes both muscular and characterological armor. Medical organ therapy increases individuals' capacity for satisfaction in life, love, and work. It does so by effectively addressing the biological basis of their emotional and psychological difficulties. The, disturbant, the, dis the disturbance of natural healthy functioning by chronic armoring.
Thank you, Dr. Chavis. Okay, I so I welcome you yourself. No, you're you're back. Great. Okay. So I I welcome any questions or comments uh, anyone in the audience may have. So, Dr. Chavis, I've got two questions that have been sent to me directly. Um, one is, how does what you spoke about apply to those with substance abuse disorder and their treatment? Okay. So anyone who has either treated someone with a substance use disorder or lives with, or lives with them knows the difficulties inherent in trying to get them to reduce or end their dependency or addiction. Why is this so? From what I've just said about the treatment of anyone with medical organ therapy, the therapeutic task and challenge is to help people identify that they're out of touch with themselves and what they do to ensure that they stay out of touch. We're talking about their armor. The function and consequence of the character and muscular armor of the individual is to deaden emotion, including anxiety, and keeping people clueless. The individual therapy of such individuals, depending on the character diagnosis, such as bipolar, hysteric, phallic, narcissist, and so on, thus varies from one to the other. Add substance abuse, substance use and abuse, and the difficulties soar. This is because the drug and drug use is armor, and the user addict is dependent on a drug or drugs to manage uncomfortable feelings. Over time, the drug replaces the other character defenses, leading to the deterioration of character and the increase in impulsivity. In early recovery, the addict gives up the dulling, the armoring effects of the drug and may become overwhelmed with anxiety and other emotions. The addict then must struggle to replace his addiction with new and old character defenses, defenses to manage his anxiety. In this, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous are very effective by teaching the addict to have a respectful and supportive relationship to his fellow man and woman and accountability to a higher power and a sponsor. The 12 steps help the addict reestablish a more rational character armor. Medication may lend a temporary strengthening of the armor as well to detox and maintain sobriety. Thank you very much for that. Um, one of the things, I mean, a lot of the case reports that you you gave, I could relate hugely to patients in my practice. So I have a patient who has a massive problem. He he had a bad accident, so he's got a T6 fracture, but that was sort of 2014. Um, but the neck and the, the muscle tension... Um, was quite is is quite incredible but what you said he lost his mum when he was 11 and he was never allowed to grieve because in this country during the war years you know men had to be men and boys don't cry and he was kicked off to a military boarding school at the age of 12 or 13 years old where basically in his first year at high school, he got the whatever kicked out of him. Mm -hmm. um, and now, particularly, we've got a very interesting um, therapy here, which when you talk about the horizontal lines, um, they use the meridians and they're using acupressure with magnetic, um, it, it charges itself. And... And uh, one of the nurses I used to work with is now getting very involved in this acupressure treatment, but it also involves the generation of a current. And clearly it's energy flow. I mean, the Chinese have known this since 5,000 BC. <laughs> so it's, and we all think that we're very clever discovering it now. But the amazing thing that I've seen, and they've had 80% success rate with pain, is the emotional release that yes. comes when which they which they're not so they've got a psychologist, a physio who's gone into Chinese medicine, and a nurse who's also a homeopath doing this treatment. And fortunately, there's a psychologist there because when there is an emotional meltdown, when pain is released, somebody is there 
to go through the talk therapy. So a question I'd like to ask you myself is we have 12 psychiatrists and it might be up to 13 or 14 serving a population of 15.2 million. Okay. There's no plan in terms of time. So can we train grandmothers? Can we train non-medical doctors to do this therapy? Because on this group, we have a range from nurses to students, all the way through to professors listening to this. And in order to be able to deliver this kind of therapy, what are your requirements to become a medical ergonomist? Well, that's a many part uh, 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 question. I'm mean, not the last part, but it's a many part question. But in terms of training medical ergonomists, the American College of Ergonomy has a training program for physicians to become medical ergonomists. And whether it's this part of our uh, training program or our training program in social ergonomy, the candidate's therapy, their own medical organ therapy is a very important part of, uh, of uh, uh, training because what you heard in, in, in my recounting with various uh, patients is sometimes I said things that might appear, and many other examples that may, might appear even outrageous or even magical, but it's, they're not. Because what this comes from, what, the, what, what this is a result of, is my ability to make profound emotional energetic contact with, with the patient. And that comes about because I've had my own, my own treatment with medical organ therapy. Um, in terms of training others to do uh, the type of treatment that you're describing, uh, the proof is always in the pudding. That's probably my favorite expression uh, uh, with uh, uh, my patients, but also others. But the proof is in the pudding. And in this case, what you're describing is, or the question is, does it work? And that is key. Because, you know, you could use two sticks together, you know, or sprinkle, you know, something on the patient. And the question is, does it work? And so from my perspective, what you've described is yes. whether, whether, whether it's whether it's I'm not sure what's going on. But Sorry, you Dr. Ch Chavis, can we please remove anybody who's unmuted off the call? And please, can you remove your videos? And because we've got bandwidth problems. Oh, so I have you, to. No, no, not you. The speaker oh. needs to be on the call, but we've got multiple people coming up who are not muting and whose videos are on. And I'd ask them from a point of view of courtesy to please remove yourself um, from from the call in terms of muting your mics because it's interrupting you, Dr. Chavis, and you're giving us your time from New York. And, oh. I, and I just think it's for courtesy's sake, please, can we remove people from the call who are not... Yeah. Um, you are not muting. Okay. So continuing my my uh, answer uh, to what you've brought up, uh, it is clear that uh, that what your your therapists do, regardless of whether they're a grandmother, or if there are grandmother therapists, you know, or acupuncturists or acupressurists, uh, whatever they do, or nurses skilled in or trained and skilled in these modalities that it relieves or or it relieves armor and the armor that it's relieved it has to be muscular you know i certainly know about acupuncture and i certainly know that the chinese have the concept of qi and you have used qi therapeutically for thousands of years reich was the first one to discover that there was an actual energy this was postulated by Western scientists over the last several centuries, but Reich was the only one who actually discovered an actual energy and investigated in the best traditions of Western science in his laboratory and then out, out in the environment. And so there was an actual energy 
that is it's, it's certainly not mystical at all even though energy has been the realm of mysticism for also for the longest time and so the way i understand the effectiveness of the treatment that the treatments that you've uh, uh described uh is that it they relieve armor however they do and so emotion is released i don't describe this you know as a meltdown you know i've had people say well that patient was psychotic on the couch absolutely not as i said with this 30 year old you know he was screaming and crying in a with god awful sounds and thrashing about He's not psychotic. He was just releasing what was held in his armor, you know, for the last 23, 25 years. So I hope that that answers the points you were making. If it's not, please, please clarify. No, this is a fascinating discussion. And, you know, um, I ended up with PTSD. Oh. Um, in, I was 43 years old, I'm 58 now, so a long time ago. Um, and basically I was involved in, uh, my best friend's daughter was killed in a horrific car crash. The car exploded. Um, they were driving a 206 and someone doing 160 K now in a 60 K zone sort of T-boned them. And the car was thrown into a wall, it exploded. And I'd been camping with her. She was friends with my daughter. So I'd been camping with her, um, oh, probably the weekend before. Um, so she died on a Tuesday, and I'd been camping with them on the Friday and the Saturday. And wonderful, wonderful, exuberant, I call her a child, but, you know, I think anybody under 30 is a child these days. So, <laughs> um, But I got the call to say that the car had exploded and I ran down the road, I kicked off my shoes and I ran down the road to her parents or his parents' house because they lived down from me. And I went in and I said, the car is registered to, and it was his first name and his middle name. And his mother collapsed and his father just grabbed me and we got in the car and went to the site. And I still can't handle the smell of pottery because we didn't even know who was driving. We identified the bodies on dental records. But it was my first experience of, you know, I, I trained in South Africa. It was a war zone, 22 people after a machete fight and gunshot chest, head and abdomen was a norm in the 1990s in South Africa. And we were, we, we became desensitized to it. But this was the first time that really I was involved with somebody that I was very close to dying. So I was waking up every night at one o'clock with these nightmares of my own children burning to death in the car. And of course, one of my colleagues became effectively my drug dealer because he said to me, no, you have to keep working. You haven't slept for three days. We can't deal without you. So I relate to your physician who put everybody else first. And I was put on to Zopiclo, no, Zopidem, which apparently is not addictive, which I'm not sure if Michael Jackson and Heath Ledger would agree who both died from the stuff. Um, and within a week, I was waking up with severe anxiety, and I'd never had anxiety before. And I didn't recognize it until now that I was actually withdrawing from the Zopiclone. So then they put me on Telepram. And now I wasn't making melatonin anymore, so I was calm, but I wasn't sleeping. But I also remember not being able to speak mm -hmm. and having this tension uh, that was unbelievable. And then... Then they put me on amitriptyline to sleep <laughs> and I got it, someone to drive me to work and I walked in and said, you can sign my sick note because I can't actually function on this stuff and I still hadn't slept. And then they put me on quetiapine and the only way where you know my your patient's taking quetiapine is if they put on five kilos a month. So 15 kilos later, I was saying, you've got to get me off this stuff because I'm now not being able to cope with my job because I was a walking zombie and I'm used to being able to change my mind very quickly, operate at speed, and I couldn't. And and then I tried to get off that stuff, and it was an absolute and utter nightmare. And I, I've never craved alcohol in my life. I've always been a social 
you know, I enjoy having, like every Zimbabwean, I socialize with a glass of wine and Christmas and whatever. But now I was getting home at five o'clock, desperate for alcohol. Yes. But I didn't recognize I was withdrawing from this the stuff I was on the night before. And yes. and I I just, I, I couldn't understand. I'd never not been a highly functional person in my life. Um, and so I very much relate to the fact that I wasn't allowed to grieve yes. because I had to look after both families. I had to look after the community. The dad um, wanted to go back flying and flying is not therapy when you've got 300 people in the back. So I had to manage everybody else, but I wasn't allowed to manage myself. Okay. Yes. Until probably 10 years later when the stresses accumulated and I, I eventually um, I went into integrative medicine to try and understand these things that the body and the mind are not separate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've got an old injury from in my shoulder from when I was 19. We used to toboggan down Jamison Hall steps on a Teflon toboggan. It's completely banned now. <laughs> but, and we used to go into a mattress and, turn and throw the toboggan up to the next person who went and did the equally suicidal and ridiculous thing. Um, and we had this as, as fresh as week and we thought it was entertainment. Um, and I do agree that the permissive parenting also goes with the loss of, so, so a lot of people use medications as artificial exhilaration, whereas my exhilaration was Teflon tobogganing down concrete and whitewater rafting on the Zambezi River. And all those things are now too dangerous for our children to do. Um, and I love Jordan Peterson when he says, never interrupt children when they're skateboarding, um, because that's how they learn lessons in, in life. But getting back to my own personal experience of this is that when you refer to someone to a psychiatrist in Zimbabwe at the moment, they get fleeced of 120 to 180 US dollars. No history, no discussion of what happened in their childhood, no discussion of their trauma happens. And I will guarantee you within three months, they're on four different drugs and they treat the side effects of the drug with a different drug. And they see them every two weeks and alter their drug cocktail. And my most recent case was a uh, depot injection, which caused insomnia. And then this perfectly functional human being four months later is going to rehab. It's, yes. it's awful to watch. Yes. What you're seeing, what you're describing is the unfortunate deterioration of psychiatry. We certainly have that in, in, uh, see the same thing in New York where basically the psychiatrist has become this prescriber of medication that therapy, so-called therapy, constitutes for many, and this has been written up, uh, constitutes, hello, how are you, what's new, and that's basically it. What I do is functional, meaning I'm actually making good emotional, energetic contact with the person as soon as they come into my office, even as they're walking in, as You've seen in in my description of some of the treatment of my of uh, uh, my patients. I was treating a woman who had advanced emphysema. She came into my office wheeling a little oxygen tank with a nasal cannula. She looked like a robot. She had been treated for panic attacks with Elevil with amitriptyline, and uh, uh, you know she was literally she talked like a robot. She moved like a robot. And I told her what I'd like to do, because even with somebody with emphysema still can have, and if it's even from smoking, can still have armoring of the chest. So I put her on the couch, I pressed on her chest, out came emotion. And over the period of, I'd say, maybe four to six weeks, I was able to taper the Elevil. Because after the very first session, when I pressed on her chest, she didn't have a, a panic attack in the following week. So I continued what I was doing physically um, and I tapered her Elevil and lo and behold, she became herself. The robotic nature that she presented with was from the Elevil. 100%. And um, she was I, a character. 
She was unbelievable. She herself was a character. She was from Brooklyn. She talked with a Brooklyn accent. If you've ever seen it in the movies, it stands for <laughs> itself. And it turns out that she loved to go to Atlantic City, which has casinos. And before she developed severe emphysema, she would go there at least twice a week. So I learned all this about her when she was off the Ellaville and she just did so much better because I was able to basically to treat the underlying cause of her uh, uh, panic attacks, which is emotion, a lot of emotion held in the chest, threatening to come out or threatening to break through the armor. And so that was uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, helpful. The other thing I want to say in regard you know, to uh, permissive parenting um, or, or parenting, in, let's say in general, is that when I treat children and I do treat children, even infants, uh, just to give them a well baby checkup for armor, um, very often a child will be referred to me uh, uh, with the, with the uh, di already with the diagnosis, attention deficit. For me, I always see the parents. And you know what I call this, the, the, the real diagnosis? Parental attention deficit. Because the parent is out of it enough so that they have little sense or little contact with the emotional life of their youngster. And how do youngsters who barely speak or speak very little, what do they usually do? They're motoric. They're agitated. They're angry. And this is a rational reaction for the parent not being able to, uh, to, uh, to, to make emotional contact with them and give the child exactly what they need. Well, we're going to have to do a whole session on um, attention deficit disorder. I actually see it as a gift because my children were diagnosed as um, ADD because they can run five trains of thought in their mind at the same time. But I just tell them not to tell anybody else that just <laughs> verbally just stick to one train of thought. That's right. But, but that's another another conversation entirely. So as we end, um, and I'd love to have you back on on ADD because it's a it's a real interest of mine um, because I agree with you. It is a way of containing children in a classroom for eight hours is to give them Ritalin, okay? Right. Um, which is a highly addictive drug that messes with uh, the natural development and the maturation of the frontal lobe in my opinion and from what I've observed. And in right. Africa, we're very much into what works. So Good. is it safe? Is it effective? Is it affordable? Is it available? And we don't, or my personal belief system is that we should not be following culturally foreign um, recommendations like Prozac and the entire drug list and anything with a disorder that's got a drug attached to it on the DSM-5. We should be approaching this from a practical point of view but to end off because without um picking your brain as much as i'd like to um can you tell us about the journal of organ therapy um because i'd love to know more about it and the medical ergonomy training yes so we're talking about the american college of ergonomy and the american college of ergonomy also known as the aco was established in 1968 and founded by Dr. Ellsworth Baker at the request of Wilhelm Reich himself, who asked Dr. Baker to assume responsibility for the future of ergonomy. The college's purpose is to set and maintain standards for all work in ergonomy, to promote and encourage scientific work in the field of ergonomy, and to provide training, education, and information to those who are interested. The training program includes training in medical organ therapy for physicians and social ergonomy for psychologists, social workers, nurses, and marital and family therapists. Also accepted in the social ergonomy tra training program are writers, politicians, business people, attorneys, and so on, those who may apply the knowledge of social ergonomy in their work. The ACO since 1967 also publishes twice a year the Journal of Ergonomy, 
containing articles on organ therapy, clinical case studies and theory, the organomic social sciences, and the innovative physical and biological research. Current and past articles from the journal can be found on the ACO website. Also found on the ACO website, which I'll put up on the screen in a second, are clinical case presentations, the different kind of psychiatry webinars and podcasts. There's an announcement of laboratory workshops in organomic science. Uh, and the next one offered is on the right blood test this coming September. And this is of particular interest in the video section of the website are videos of medical organomists presenting their work. And I'm gonna point this out that videos are located by clicking on media and publications then video. I say this because I heartily recommend viewing my two presentations there by scrolling down. <laughs> and the titles are The Benefits of an Immediate Understanding of a Patient's Character and Treating the Elderly. It's Never Too Late to Start Medical Organ Therapy. Now, what I'd like to do is just see if I can screen share. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to show, can you see that? I can see it. Okay, it's the ACO website and also my email address. And I, uh, uh, I recommend looking at the ACO website. It is very clear, very well organized, and there's a ton of information on there for anyone who's interested. I include my email address because if anyone has questions or comments that they'd like to share about my presentation, I'd love to hear from you. I cannot uh, regrettably answer any questions you may have about uh, particular patients or individuals. Uh, I mean, that's, we, we understand the confidentiality aspect 100%. So um, I'm aware that we're running on Namibian time, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with how the Germans run things, but um, but uh, it's kind of, I'm already know that I'm five minutes over. So I'd just like to thank you, and I hope that we can get you back on to discuss yes. other things. Um, my background, I don't necessarily identify as a medical doctor anymore, because uh, partly because the profession is in disarray at the moment, but also because um, my real love was medical biochemistry, in which I have an honours degree. So I kind of think at cellular level. And I'm my thesis when I did my honours degree was on chloride channels. Um, so I'm very interested in in energy and mitochondria and exactly how we, because we can record electromagnetic fields that come off people. And I, the person I refer to once I walked in and when I say she's a Western trained nurse, she's got epilepsy. She's got a, a little badge that says sister. She's 10 years older than me. She looks like the nicest granny in the world. And I came in one day and she said, oh, your aura is white today. And I looked at her and she said, oh, and I said, it's fine. I'm very open-minded to these things because I have a very good friend whose daughter since the age of three could clearly, I could tell you stories about this child who's now 22. Um, and and she could clearly see a world that we couldn't see um, in terms of, you know, um, she once said, oh, granny and your sister are in the room. And we said, no, granny and... Granny's in Cape Town, the sister's in London, and this child said, at the age three years old, said, no, 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 not my granny, your granny. You need to give your sister a name. And it wasn't, or you need to tell your mom to give your sister a name. And it wasn't until we made the phone call to her mom that we realized that there'd been a miscarriage and that they never knew the sex of the baby. And then this child said, we said, well, are they still in the stairwell? And she said, no, 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 they've gone. And she was like, playing with her unicorns on the ground and totally aware of a spiritual world that clearly we could not see, but that gift has never been suppressed in her. She won't tell us what's happening with the stock exchange, but she will, um, <laughs> she will predict things with uncanny ability. 
So I think we need to be open to these people that can see a different world and they have a healing energy. Yes. And I'm certainly, and I was very aware in the COVID years, a recess took everything out of me. Mm. But I wasn't, and I couldn't pour from an empty cup. But mm. I, I wasn't aware that there were people, and I saw it in COVID, that had this ability to transfer their emotional energy to someone else. But then mm. they needed to go and recharge from somewhere else. And I think that until we are open to these things, we will be stuck in the lockstep of the DSM-5, which is, I don't even get me started on that document. Um, but DSM-5. Disordered, basically. But, but DSM-5 expresses the mechanistic thinking that I referred to because there's no, literally no understanding of any of the so-called disorders listed in DSM-5. It's presented as called reification, that if you give it a name, it implies understanding, but there is none. Mm -hmm. And what it, what, it, what it leads to is exactly what we see in psychiatry today, and that's treatment with medication. By a medication or two medications, and as you so rightly said, then you get medication to treat the side effects. It's, it's awful. It's awful. And it's unfortunately, a, it, 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 a patient cured is a customer lost. Yeah. And between the statins and the SSRIs, I think that there are lessons to be learned going forwards for those of us that are interested in curing patients and good patient outcomes. Yes. Um, and it's just very sad that it's come to the point where we are apologizing for actually listening to patients. And we are stuck in, my favorite is the K10. So it says, how often were you sad last week? And never ask me how often I was happy last week. Yes, I was sad last week, someone passed away, you know, the dog died. It was the anniversary of someone's funeral. So of course I was sad last week, but I was also very happy at times last week. And it, it, it just, it's a, the drug companies used to come and give us these questionnaires to give to patients. And if you scored more than a certain amount on the K10, then you went on to venlafaxine. Yeah. And venlafaxine is a terribly addictive and horrible substance. And if you give it to elderly patients in a week's time, they're coming crawling up the wall. And of course, the psychiatrist isn't answering their phone after hours. So you now are dealing with a patient who can't take this drug and can't get off it. And right. they're at high risk of a fall and a hip fracture, which will kill them. Right. Right. And, and what has happened to psychiatry is not doing psychiatrists who prescribe like this any favors. And the problem is they all meet together and it's like the Dunning-Kruger effect. They all verify their own behavior is acceptable because everybody's doing it. Um, and the frontline doctors who genuinely care about patients are left to like my daughter, my youngest daughter um, had a wonderful, wonderful friend who hung himself earlier this year. Now, of all of her friends who I would never have expected to do it, it was him. And the story was he went to South Africa after coming back from the UK, we are, we know that the Department of Defense data is showing 36% neuropsychiatric um, effects after um, certain untested medications have been rolled out. And he was subjected to these in order to attend um, an interior disease. He was an incredibly artistic young man. And one of his rules for life was dance, even if you dance badly, you know? and sing even if you sing badly and just live. And he basically was injected, came home, and then he was, he was just not right. So they sent him to South Africa and he was sent back on a cocktail, including Alprazolam, which has an off effect that is a real problem. And then obviously he couldn't get the drugs because the psychiatrist was not working that week. And he started getting whatever was required on the street. 
And he ended up this magnificent, wonderful, empathetic, lovely human being hanged himself successfully. And his parents, I don't think, will ever recover. And who's actually morally liable for that death? And my honest opinion is it's the person who wrote the script for the al Prazalam and then deferred all responsibility and didn't answer their phone. And there we leave a child withdrawing and he died shortly after his 21st birthday. What a waste of such a magnificent life. Yes. And so I feel quite strongly suicide is the ultimate failure of the medical system. And people talk about iatrogenocide. Mm. And, and I do think that psychiatry is contributing to the suicide rates rather than improving them when practiced according to the DSM-5 and this mechanistic lockstep thinking. Um, and the problem is that once you've got somebody on medication and you disable their frontal lobe, they are unable to step out of themselves and see the situation in the third person. So I can put myself in your shoes. I don't know what temperatures in New York, but I bet you it's hotter here. Um, and we've had the most beautiful, magnificent blue sky autumn day in Zimbabwe. And um, I can put myself in your shoes, but I can also step out of the conversation and I can watch our interaction as a third person. You can't do that if your frontal lobe is disabled and these drugs disable the frontal lobe. So you remove the very thing that the patient needs to get better, which substances do as well. And the yes. person is not in denial. They actually have a disabled frontal lobe and they can't see their own behavior because their frontal lobe is not working. Um, and they're working purely on the limbic system. So wonderful talk. I could speak to you for hours and hours, but I'm getting a little, what you call them, nudges from the German Namibians because it's time to end the call. So thank you. What a privilege to hear you. And I'm so glad um, if I'd recall, if, if we'd had this conversation last week, I was running around like a headless chicken with a broken car on the way to the Eastern Highlands on the Mozambique border. But today I had time. Yes. And thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you for, I suppose, um, verifying and validating what many people do here without having a large double blind placebo controlled randomized trial to prove yeah. that randomized works. Randomized controls like that placebo. That's mechanistic science. And as I said in the beginning of my talk, mechanistic thinking does not apply, uh, uh, is destructive in terms of understanding the living. So every single patient I presented is their own control. And again, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> I love I that. It's in one of my slides. The yeah, proof is in wanna... the pudding... And, and don't argue with real world data, is yes. I suppose what I'm and saying. I wanna, and I want to thank you for having me, allowing me the opportunity to speak to all of you today. Well, thank you for joining us from New York. And out of interest, what is the weather there like today? Uh, today, it's a, it's a nice day. It's But it, it actually was beautiful last week. It was like in the 60s. And now it's, I don't know, maybe 45 uh, okay, uh, we, that's Fahrenheit. That's Fahrenheit. So. Yeah, we think in Celsius. So, I know. so it's, it was probably about twenty-eight to thirty-three Celsius today. Yeah. So it was stunning. But I will say I have two stories from New York. One is that I just love Central Park. Okay, oh. but the other thing is I went to Grand Central and I got on the wrong train. And as I entered Brooklyn, somebody said, "Lady," because obviously I'm I don't look like I'm from Brooklyn. Do you know where you're going? And I said, well, I thought I was, you know, on my way. I think I was going to Boston. And they went, nah, <laughs> you're on the train to Brooklyn. Get off at the station, turn around and go back. But I met some unbelievable characters on that train. It was fantastic. Nice. Um, so I, I have fond memories of not going to Brooklyn because I was 
turned around and it was suggested that I might need to change my appearance to get, get more of a tan to go to Brooklyn. But um, New York, wonderful city. I love the energy. I love the, the pace. But I have to say, I can only do it for 